want to do a short video about some batteries we're working on. You might recall that we did a prototype for a Canadian company. It's an aviation firefighting battery, and uh, we're going to start calling it the hardened aviation battery. It's one Tesla Model S module in a box, but we want the box to be uh, quite hardened, um, resistant to um, weather, water, foam, heat, vibration, and um, fire and smoke. And uh, so that's a little bit of an issue. And it really needs to be one of the reasons we're building it for them and trying to test a battery module is it needs to put out 750 amps for 30 seconds to blow foam. And uh, so we worked on a set for them, sent it to them, they liked it, but they had told me that it was going to directly drive 32 motors at, as an inductive load. And so we didn't put a battery pre-charge in it that apparently may have been uh, bad advice. Maybe they're not wanting to reveal some of their uh, secret sauce. But now they've decided they want pre-charge and two batteries. And so that's what we're building. Let's take a look at the diagram here for a minute. We uh, have added a 25 ohm, uh, 50 watt pre-charge resistor across the terminals of our Gigavac GX16 uh, BAB contactor. We use that contactor, it's rated for 600 amps, it can do about 1500 briefly and 1800 volts. Um, and we're just going to do that on the positive um, uh, terminal and we're also going to add a uh, Mersin fuse uh, to that uh, line but we need to be able to pre-charge so we've added this resistor and this uh, relay the relay we're using is a Tyco Kilovac um, high voltage um, 12 volt uh, coil relay and we uh, it's a little bit of overkill for this application, but overkill is always appropriate. And we're going to connect that to a switch ground on pin 18. This is our um, Tesla BMS uh, controller. It's just an EVTV Dewey with a shield on it that lets us uh, have four switch grounds, some inputs, uh, all of them isolated, and talk to the battery, of course. And we've got that wired up with uh, one, two, three, four, five wires to a Molex plug that connects to the uh, BMS board on the Tesla uh, battery. And so we can turn this pre-charge on and pre-charge at 25 ohms and 25 volts fully charged would be about an amp. Um, even a large capacitors, the reason for this pre-charge, and it comes up over and over and over, is so many devices have um, large input capacitors. Um, now, as I said, I thought this was large inductors. Inductors resist a change in current. Um, and so there's no problem firing into an inductive load, but a capacitive load resists a change in voltage. And it can take a kind of infinite current for a very brief time, and then as the voltage in the capacitor comes up, uh, it begins to resist that current. The problem is the first 10 nanoseconds, uh, we can see a huge uh, 10,000 amp voltage spike, which welds our contactors and occasionally blows up their capacitors. And so we have a necessity to pre-charge but the capacitors, even very large capacitors, at an amp, even it's not very long, until they've risen enough in voltage that that initial surge doesn't happen. And so um, uh, an amp for five or six seconds is more than adequate to charge even fairly large capacitors. We can configure that time period 
to be as long as they want. And so that's uh, kind of that. We, uh, just to go over this a little bit, we have a, a DC to DC converter. It takes uh, 18 to 72 volts uh, in and puts out 12 volts. And that's what we use to run everything in this module, including our controller and our shield, uh, but also light LEDs and power our uh, BMS board, um, serial link, and uh, so forth. So when we uh, switch that switch, we're simply connecting the input to the uh, Tesla battery module at 18 to 25 volts, and that gives us our 12 volts. Um, we put a uh, 12 volts on the uh, ramp in the switch and run the ground to pin 19 of our uh, uh, shield, and that's a switch ground output, and so we can use that to uh, flash the light, energize the light, flash the light. When we uh, close the contactor with an enable signal, another switch ground, we then read the aux contacts, which are wired for 12 volts, if that contactor indeed closes, will get a confirmation 12 volts in a uh, isolated digital input uh, on pin 8 of the shield. And that tells us that the contactor is closed. More importantly, if we open the contactor, it will also tell us that it opened and it's not welded, which is the purpose of that. Um, and so, we can uh, control this lamp in the switch, and what we use that for is when we're doing pre-charge, we'll flash the lamp, and when we uh, actually close the contactor, we'll put it on steady. And we'll maintain that as a steady light down to 30% state of charge. From there on down, the lamp starts flashing, oh, once per second, on and off and that rate will increase as the state of charge decreases to where it's very rapid, it's almost like a dim light uh, at zero percent. And so it's a variable flash rate that will give you some indication. Uh, if it's flashing, you're below 30 percent and how fast you're flashing is kind of a, a visual uh, without doing very much. So these things in a pod under a helicopter, you should be able to see that light. Um, on the ground and, and be able to tell if you're below 30% and pretty much how much below 30%. Uh, we've got a CAN output, we've got a uh, charge enable output, which again has 12 volts and switch ground. Now if you measure that, you're always going to read 12 volts, but the ground um, isn't enough uh, you have a little leakage through that MOSFET, but it isn't enough to drive anything, even an LED. Uh, but when we uh, switch that ground, then it can. And normally you would use that to switch some sort of a, a contact or a relay uh, to uh, control your uh, charging, perhaps from solar panels or whatever. In this particular case, we use our CAN output and have code in here to use a TCCH charger, we use a little 1.8 kilowatt TCCH charger. That's uh, the highest current we can get at these very low voltages. And um, it'll do about 23 amps. Uh, you can, of course, parallel them for about 45 amps uh, to charge this uh, battery, which, of course, uh, has uh, 2. Uh, 233 amp hours in it, a little over 5 kilowatts. So that's our schematic diagram. Let's take a look inside these uh, two boxes and I'll show you a little bit about how we've got it wired up. Here's one of our boxes we currently have in work. And uh, we'll look inside a little bit. Here you can see our shield and board on top of 
of a plastic thing. This is a cable that plugs into a, a charge enable port. And here, kind of a nice mill spec type two pin. Here you can see the front panel. This is our um, can port. We use pins. It's an RJ11. We use pin 4 and 5 for a can and 1 and 8 for power. 1 being power, 8 being ground. 4 is can high and 5 is can low. Here's our, our hammer slap switch. And our uh, USB port. This is a uh, Rebling aircraft connector for power and quite capable of handling the current and voltage we want to use. Inside here is a Gigavac GX16 ABA. It has uh, a coil, but it also has. A aux contacts that we run back to our controller for um, reporting the state of the contactor over here in the corner um, you'll see our um, 50 watt 25 ohm resistor it'll let us pre-charge it about an amp and here's a Tyco Kilovac uh, kind of high voltage um, type of uh, relay and we control that relay with uh, one of our outputs uh, from the board. Here's the Cutler Hammer switch. Of course we uh, connect our uh, DC to DC converter through that and uh, we have a lamp circuit where we can flash it. This is a uh, little bar for our 12 volts. We run the output of our 12 volt uh, DC to DC converter down in the corner to that and get 12 volts to operate everything else. The module is strapped in with some ultra high molecular weight uh, PVC and aluminum strap and some bolts so it'll be very secured at, you know, flight. And so you can see our negative uh, contact connected to the Rebling and our positive is too both by copper bars we'll have another copper bar here going up to our fuse and so that's uh, what we're putting together right now and this one is nearly enough complete in fact it's charging at the moment and you can see our screen here with the EVIC display shows uh, 24.7 volts about 87 percent and we're charging uh, currently at about 4.13 volts per thing it's uh, 89.6 degrees out and we're hooked up there's our charger It's hooked up here to our Rebling. And inside, we're pretty much complete here. We've got our uh, board. It's our limb cab um, current sensor. Our uh, fuse. Here you can get a shot of the contactor. The Recharge, resistor and fuse, and uh, all that. So that's the inside of a more or less completed one. Um, of course, we have one connection to the BMS board on the Tesla module uh, to read the voltages and temperatures. 
and we get the current from this limb cab um, current sensor it's very uh, precise it'll do up to 500 amps quite accurately it'll do above that but it's very linear up to 500 and uh, it uh, uh, reports it to our board over a CAN bus and we're connected here on the CAN bus our BMS uh, shield CAN bus is what we bring out to the front panel and so that's our uh, device uh, we've got these hinges on the side butterfly hinges to uh, connect the uh, cover and uh, it's got truck bed liner all over it, aluminum uh, case, and it's quite hardy for some exposed to the air type aviation work. Um, it has to be pretty tough. We've got these seals here for the cover, and uh, it should be pretty uh, well weather tight and water tight and foam tight and all that. And so that's what's inside. We can connect to this through an exposed USB port right here and right here uh, with a regular USB cable. And we have an ASCII text, a uh, very simple old school uh, ASCII text output that we uh, can view with uh, any uh, terminal program. Now the terminal program needs to be set for 115,200 BPS, eight data bits, no parity, and one stop bit. This is so old school, a lot of people are having trouble uh, configuring it, particularly with Windows. Um, and it helps if your terminal program will acknowledge a form feed, the display will uh, be more regular. And so this is how we can access the software to make configuration changes. Let's have a look at that. Okay, here we are with our aviation battery uh, module, which we're doing uh, a single module in a hardened uh, case. This is the software um, available through the USB port currently. And we're viewing it with a terminal program on a Macintosh called Cool Term. And we can see I've been up uh, 34 minutes and 29 seconds. Um, this is a summary line. It gives me my voltage for the entire um, module. Um, terminal 1, temperature. Terminal 2, temperature. Our status is no faults reported. Our average cell voltage is 3.89. Our average temperature of those two terminals is 28.66. And our current state of charge is 63.66%. Here is the readings we get from the uh, BMS board on the uh, module. Uh, cell 1, cell 2, cell 3 cell 4, cell 5, and cell 6. Each cell is 74, 18, 650 uh, battery uh, cell cylinders, um, but they're all in parallel. And that you can see we get a pretty fine um, report of voltage on each of those. Our current comes from the limb cab current sensor which now we can uh, update every 100 milliseconds instead of every 10 milliseconds. It really takes quite a load off of our processor with the new uh, C500 SP3 version of that. Our power is calculated from our voltage and our current. Our amper hours are actually counted um, from that uh, current sensor and so our watt hours uh, can be calculated as well. Uh, since we brought it up, this um, version, our max system discharge current is 0.47 amps. 
Our max system charge current is 22.42 amps. We're currently charging at 22.24. The max pack voltage is 23.31 a session. And the minimum pack voltage has been 22.81 when we first brought it up. Um, right now, here's our high and low cells. Uh, we have configured the battery for 240 amp hours, and that uh, pretty much determines um, the, the configured battery capacity, and our amp hours is how we calculate the state of charge. The amp hours, as I say, are accumulated by the LimCab 300, and our configured battery capacity we simply enter. Uh, we've got some EEPROM data where we retain um, the charging and discharging lifetime, but I had reset that. So we've put 3.32 kilowatt hours in so far to get to this 64%, uh, and we haven't discharged any. any. Our pre-charge relay is off, and our contactor is on. Uh, one of the things they wanted us to add is pre-charge. They originally told me this battery would feed directly 32 um, DC um, fans or motors. Uh, we'll come to find out they're actually driven by an inverter, have a huge input capacitor, so they wanted me to add a pre-charge uh, function to it, which we did with a uh, 25 ohm resistor and kind of a high... Um, lifetime relay. Temperature alarms, we haven't had any voltage alarms, we haven't any, and we have charge enable on right now. This line only appears when we're charging, it says AC charger reports charging at 23.10 amps and 23.7 um, volts DC, charging to 25 volts DC. This is a TCCH charger which we um, control by our CAN port uh, coming out of the uh, module. And um, so our target voltage, well, it's currently reporting that it's charging at 23.10 amps. Now, we're measuring that at 22.25. And I've checked our limb cab measurement with some fluke equipment. And I, uh, I like our version better, but this is what the charger thinks it's doing and is reporting over CAN. It also reports that it's currently measuring the battery voltage at 23.7. You know, understand that it's correcting for the current through the cables it's connected to. It's very difficult to me measure voltage on the same line that you're uh, charging on. And again, we like our voltage of 23.3325 here a little better. The 25.08 volts DC were uh, commanding the charger to charge to that. And that's based on our uh, cutoff uh, voltage that we have uh, configured for charging. Let's go to the configuration screen. Uh, here's some single line commands. We can toggle the contactor on, on and off. We can toggle charge enable on and off. We can clear faults. We can erase our login EEPROM. And uh, a capital L will print our log to screen in long form. A lowercase l prints log to screen, comma, separated for import to your Microsoft Excel, for example. Z resets the state of charge values. To 100%, it's currently at 64.47. Uh, we can set our CAN zero speed, which is what we use to connect to the limb cab, or CAN one speed, uh, in this case 250 kbps, for external CAN that connects to the charger and the EVIC display. Uh, again, our capacity, this is an arbitrary value we enter after measuring the battery uh, uh, 
capacity uh, and it's an arbitrary value you can set it to anything. Amp hours is currently minus 85.28 that's uh, again calculated by the uh, LIM tab but it's kind of a running calculation and we can enter anything we want to in here. Whatever we enter will appear as negative if we count our amp hours uh, discharging as negative and charging as a reduction of our negative value and so amp hours out are negative or discharged and uh, amp hours in are positive. Our pre-charge we have set to 6.5 seconds and they can configure that to about anything. Our high voltage uh, determines where we uh, shut down the system. If any cell the high, highest cell in the pack reaches 4.2, we will simply shut down and disconnect the uh, uh, module, and you'll have to come take a look at it um, using this USB screen to determine what's the matter, uh, but you've somehow overcharged uh, the battery, and this is to prevent overcharging the battery if you reach 4.20. That would probably be something we normally could set to 4.25 or so if you wanted to charge the full 4.2 um, but we've got it set for 4.2 now. Low voltage is your low cell voltage limit for contactor cutoff and again we would simply disconnect the main contactor and, and the module would no longer operate if any cell falls below uh, 3 volts. Variance, this is pretty generous, it's a quarter of a volt, I would normally set that to 0.2 volts or even 0.15. If we measure a difference between cell voltages uh, and, and from the high to the low, actually it's not from the high to the low, it's from the high or low to the average of the six cells. Uh, this will cause the system to shut down. High temp will uh, cut off the contactors if we exceed 45 degrees C on any of our temperature sensors, which we have two. A low temp, uh, if we fall below 5, we would also disconnect the uh, battery. Uh, zero is really the, the uh, point that you don't want to go below and for charging really. Cut off and resume are about charging. Cut off we're going to charge to 4.18 uh, volts and um, uh, at that point we would set charge enable off if any cell uh, uh, breaches 4.18 volts. Now if uh, the we've charged it and now we're discharging it, we wouldn't turn charge enable on again until we hit resume. I've got this set to three, that's so I can toggle it on and off and do some testing. Normally you would set this to something like 3.8 or 3.9. This is to prevent hysteresis when you're charging, you reach this cutoff, you cut off the, uh, now this does not open the contactors, this opens your charge enable output. A 12 volt switch ground. Uh, we would cut that off at 4.18. Well, as soon as we quit charging, that voltage will fall back uh, a few hundreds, and um, and so we don't want to get to that and then cut it off and and uh, then then when it gets below that, turn it back on. It would sit there and cycle. So we cut it off here, and when it falls to this value we would resume and I'd normally set that to 3.9 volts or something so we're fully charged and then we discharge for a while until we get to 3.9 and then we turn the charge enable output back on uh, normally this is going to um, charge from solar panels and so you don't want to shut off the solar panels so your battery is empty you just want to shut it off until that we were no longer overcharging the cells. And so when, when it reaches 3.9 or even 4 volts, but 3.8 to 4 volts, um, I would have it resume 
and again we're, we're available for charging uh, now if we're enabling a contactor to solar panels that simply cuts them back in and they're helping to provide power to the uh, thing but we're not overcharging the, uh, the batteries sensitivity is a kind of a funny thing the, the software the, the BMS board on the uh, uh, module it's possible we can get an anomalous reading uh, we read a lot and uh, it's possible to get an anomalous one that really doesn't indicate uh, anything. Uh, it's reading a high voltage or temperature excursion that doesn't exist. It's just a data error. And that happens particularly when we first bring up the system. And um, so sensitivity means we have to have a hundred of those errors, a uh, hundred indications that were over voltage or under um, temperature or over temperature under voltage before we'll actually trigger the contactors now this is not as um, generous as you might imagine if we measure the voltages above 4.2 volts um, once um, and continue to operate we're going to measure that again it's not going to quit, and we do that about 10 times a second, um, or more, 50 times a second. So within one or two seconds, we'll accrue enough of these um, failure alarms uh, to trigger it with a sensitivity of 100. The sensitivity can be set from 0 to 255. Um, it's just an 8-bit integer. But it gives you a uh, false alarm pad. You don't want to shut down your whole solar system uh, because of an anomalous data read. Uh, but if you get 100 of them in a row, that's um, or 100 of them over the course of a day, uh, at, at some point you're going to have to acknowledge that we have an issue. And as I say, those accrue uh, really within a second or two if you're really over voltage. If it's just a uh, data anomaly, uh, it increments the counter, uh, and you got to have a hundred of them before it uh, uh, triggers. And so that's what, so you can adjust that sensitivity. And so here we can see we're charging at 23 amps. Um, we're at Minus eight, we're 81 amps discharge out of 240, and we're at 65.9 percent stated charge. Now, I've got some logging functions uh, in order to be able to save these configuration items. We've had to provision an EEPROM in the, our controller board, and that EEPROM it's uh, like a 256k EEPROM. EEPROMs are so cheap. Getting a smaller one doesn't gain us anything. Uh, the things are 20 cents or something um, for up 256k and 19.8 cents a piece for a 1k, you know, that sort of thing. So we have 256 kilobits um, of uh, data available. And uh, so our configuration items, all of these. Um, and accrued items that we want to carry from one session to the next are kilowatt hours and lifetime charging and amp hours and so forth. Uh, don't account for 100 bytes out of 256. Uh, okay. And so what we've done is set up the rest of it for logging. Now, this particular application is going to use not very much power. Uh, for an hour or so, and then it's going to try to dump 750 amps for 30 seconds. So I've got this kind of hardwired to take a uh, logging session every uh, uh, five seconds. Now you might do that on a solar uh, application every 
in five minutes, but I want them to be able to analyze what happened to our voltage and particularly our uh, uh, temperature. Um, well, mostly our voltage uh, every five seconds. And so um, that's what we're doing here. Um, and I can do that long form by entering a capital L and that prints it out with the hour, the minute, and the second um, and the voltage, current, and amp hours and state of charge. It saves all that um, every five seconds. Now that only gives me, uh, we've only got about a, room for about a thousand, uh, thousand twenty-four log data entries every five minutes. That's like, uh, or every two minutes, like 13 days worth. But um, it's much less for this, but you would normally uh, restart that or erase it uh, before every flight, which might be an hour or two. And so uh, we can have a much finer. Now it does kind of take some time to write to that EEPROM. And so uh, five seconds is actually quite an interrupt on our processor uh, blocking to write to the EEPROM. But we write as whole pages and that makes it a little faster. And, uh, and we'll do some things. Um, to ameliorate that in the software. Um, and so you can see we've got a record um, here going from uh, essentially 0% state of charge to uh, 66. Um, and that's uh, uh, given the amp hours and the, the voltage and the current we're charging at uh, by time every five seconds. And that's how we're going to generate a uh, um, charge curve graph for the modules. But in, in practice for them, they're going to want to see what happened before, during, and after a 30 second 750 amp burn and so that's what we're working on here uh, and that's uh, that's our data log and it doesn't have a hard drive it doesn't have a card uh, it doesn't have any kind of external memory device other than an EEPROM right on the controller which are pretty hardy uh, if I enter a lowercase l I get the same data, but it's simply data, comma, separated, and so much easier to import into a spread, spreadsheet as a comma separated uh, uh, data text file and, uh, and a CSV. And so then we can bring it into Excel and do some very interesting things like um, right now we're creating a graph of voltage and state of charge against amp hours. And this is our charge curve in voltage. And uh, as you can see, it's sharp uh, at the beginning when we're fully discharged, and then it levels out. But it's much steeper than the lithium iron phosphate cells we're accustomed to. Again, we're fully charged at 25 volts. And so um, this is what I've got so far. We're still collecting data, but this was up to 60%. And so that's uh, kind of what how this uh, software works um, for the uh, aviation hardened uh, battery module that we create from a Tesla Model S uh, battery. One of the things, of course, we have in the software is the ability to log data. So, uh, 
I've uh, done some charging and discharging, confirming about 233 amp hours in these Tesla battery modules, uh, one and a half amp hour at a time, uh, and logging that for this helicopter application. I'm going to log every five seconds, and that so they can have some definition. They're not going to run the battery too long, but they might want to see what it's doing uh, in their system. And so that gives us a good opportunity to log charge and discharge curves. Let's take a look at the charge and discharge curve for a Tesla Model S um, uh, battery module. Here's a Tesla Model S battery module charge curve. Pretty um, straightforward thing. We created this uh, by logging the, the data um, while charging the aviation battery we're building. Um, and we did so at a fairly slow rate, about 21 or 22 amp hours. This is graph, this is voltage of the uh, module graphed against amp hours. Uh, the amp hours uh, from minus 233 year discharge, 233 amp hours, up to um, zero. And uh, we took a sample every two amp hours from that log data, not by time, because our charge rate might vary, but by amp hours. So every two amp hours, we uh, graph a uh, voltage data point, and that takes us from what we're calling 0% uh, state of charge up to 100%, which you can see graphed here. Um, but the important element is our voltage curve, and of course it comes up very quickly as we add just a little bit of uh, current to it. Uh, we did it at a fairly steady rate, but the data points, again, are mapped to two amp hour increments along the amp hour uh, horizontal axis. And so it takes the time element kind of out of it. Uh, your state of charge will be a function of um, how many amp hours you've put in, however fast or slow, slowly you do that. Uh, by doing it at a 21, 22 amp rate, we uh, do it fairly slowly. Um, in fact, it took about 11 hours to charge this uh, battery module this way. All that should give us a fairly accurate um, voltage um, charge curve. I'm surprised at what we got. Um, and the reason is, we're used to seeing charge curves that are uh, kind of uh, uh, S-shaped, that come up quickly, uh, flatten out, and then turn sharply up. In this case, we came up quickly enough, but then we, uh, uh, instead of flattening out, we started a fairly linear progression against our state of charge um, of voltage. And uh, if this is replicated on our discharge side at all similarly, uh, it indicates that we could probably better use voltage to determine the state of charge, certainly than in a LiPo 4 cell or an NCM cell. Uh, so the, this surprises me a little bit. Uh, it's fairly linear uh, along the way. You can see at 50% state of charge, we're at about 21 and a half volts. And that is indeed what we're calling the nominal voltage of the, of the battery. Um, so that's what an actual charge curve plotted fairly accurately. Um, it looks like on the, a full uh, Tesla Model S uh, battery module um, plotted against the number of amp hours uh, actually 
put into the into the the module. Um, obviously, this is the full module voltage. Um, you can divide this by six to get your uh, um, sound voltages, and uh, of course, you can double this uh, if you want to do a forty-eight volt uh, um, battery. Uh, for a solar installation, but this is a single Tesla Model S battery module. The charge curve size be interesting to see if the discharge curve um, is similar. Okay, uh, here we're uh, examining the Tesla Model S battery module discharge curve. We did this a little bit differently. We set our capacity for 220 amp hours. And uh, we discharged into a Peltier cooling device, a 24 volt system. Uh, we started at about nine and a half uh, amps current drain, and we uh, that decreased to about 7.3 or 7.4 by the end of the discharge. So it did vary over the uh, discharge curve. But then we took the voltages at exactly one amp hour increments. And across the bottom, you can see amp hours from zero to minus 220 uh, discharging. And that is what our voltage points are plotted. A pretty accurate 220 um, points then. And you can see in the red, our voltage discharge curve this is um, not by time, it's by amp hours, and so it's really quite accurate. Uh, the green line, of course, is a simple state of charge, and you can kind of see how it uh, varies there from linear. But um, again, it's a very sloped discharge curve where voltage um, really does quite indicate our state of charge. Uh, unlike um, many of the lithium iron phosphate cells and really in lithium cells in general that we've examined this is a true discharge curve of a full Model S uh, 5 kilowatt hour pack and uh, it's got some humps in it and so forth these are not caused by changes in current drain it's a fairly constant current drain it starts at nine and a half and decreases very linearly um, to about 7.3 amps and these are plots again at each amp hour increment and so this is a quite accurate uh, discharge curve um, for our pack um, again not terribly unusual here we go vertical kind of at about 19.8 volts and so this would be the ideal point here about 19.8 to set your uh, cut off and that would be uh, oh uh, divided by six um, is uh, about three um, 0.3 volts um, that'd be 18 19.8 so about 3.3 volts right here per cell is the point where it turns vertical and that's kind of a high uh, voltage uh, to be pretty much at the end and you can see here we're down to 5% at 18.3 so a good safe place would be uh, between 19.3 and 19.8 um, to maintain long life um, on your uh, uh, battery modules and of course we have that in there as a cell voltage so about 3.3 3.2 um, volts we've been setting it at 3 and that's down here that's a little deep I would not uh, let it go to three um, uh, any going forward 
I can see now from this discharge curve, really about 3.3 volts is ideal. These are quite accurate voltage measurements um, taken here and uh, current measurements and amp hour calculations. And so I would uh, uh, call this about a 210 or 212 usable amp hours and I would cut it off at 3.3 volts. Now that's uh, kind of interesting in that they're calling the midpoint um, 3.6 uh, which would be uh, 21.6 volts and that's right up here at the 50 percent mark so we see a fairly small decrease from the midpoint of the battery uh, down to the point where the discharge goes vertical at 19.8 volts and 19.8 should be 3.3 volts so 3.3 here and 3.6 here um, is about your uh, uh, thing. The first uh, little bit of course is fairly vertical but it flattens out and becomes quite linear here pretty uh, pretty quickly. Um, that's about uh, 4 point uh, 1 volts up there down to your 3.3 uh, and so that's your effective uh, usable range and I'm going to alter our uh, configuration to cut off at 3.3 volts uh, this is fairly surprising but big dive from 3.3 uh, um, and I would call that uh, um, oh, 212 amp, amp hours uh, to uh, eight, another 8 amp hours is what you get from 3.3 down to 3 a trivial amount and not worth um, endangering your batteries in any way so I find this surprising we had not We've looked at discharge curves before uh, for Panasonic batteries, but these are Tesla uh, versions of that. And we know they have uh, altered the uh, amount of nickel uh, and decreased the amount of cobalt, even in the Model S batteries, and uh, more so in the Model 3. But I, I you know, I've got to express some surprise here. This is, uh, we're, we're pretty much done for all practical purposes at 3.3 volts. And I would not operate um, these uh, um, cells below that. And that puts our low voltage cutoff at uh, about uh, uh, 39.6 volts on a 48 volt system. I've been shooting for 36 on the inverters, and uh, um, I think that's a little low at this point. Uh, it's good to have the inverter keep working, um, but we're going to uh, start cutting off at 3.3 volts. So a surprising discharge curve, uh, one in how linear it is, and number two, how high our voltage is when at this point we're in a vertical dive uh, there's eight amp hours between 3.3 and 3 and uh, you can have them um, I don't need them uh, for anything we're doing and there's no point in even putting ourselves in that um, dive to the ground uh, we'll go to 3.3 uh, and call it a day uh, interesting information that wraps it up. Um, that's our examination of what we're doing with these helicopter batteries. Um, it's one application for electric vehicle batteries. Um, it takes a little bit of work, 
these are ridiculously overbuilt and extremely expensive um, because of the way we've uh, built them. Um, but for the application they're going in, I think they need all that. And I do have some experience, both in aviation, uh, the military, and firefighting. So it's, uh, I kind of have a pretty good picture of what they need, I think. Um, of course, that could be wrong. Um, but this is a, uh, an example of an overbuilt battery system uh, using Tesla Model S uh, battery. Stay with us, there'll be more.